Thank you, President Ainley, for that very warm introduction, and to you and to Judith for your warm welcome to Union, for the graciousness of your home and what you are building and have built here. Thank you both. Uh, I learned not just from my own wife, the gifted First Lady of Brandeis University, but from another gifted First Lady, Abigail Adams, who always said, John, remember the ladies. It is wonderful to be with all of you on this great double celebration occasion, the 222nd anniversary of the founding of this great school, and the 200th anniversary of the founding of the Alpha Chapter of New York, of Phi Beta Kappa, here at Union College. Now, I do understand that it was the second time that Union College had sought a chapter of Phi Beta Kappa. The first process was a little less successful than the second. So allow me now, 215 years later, to say, I'm sorry. <laughs> and I'm glad we got it straightened out in 1817. The connection between our two institutions are deep, profound, and inextricable. Let me start with the mottos. Phi Beta Kappa, the letters Phi Beta Kappa are drawn from the Greek motto, Philosophia Biu Cybernetes, which we usually translate as love of learning is the guide of life. But my classics colleagues give me a somewhat more literary translation of Cybernetes, which is particularly relevant for our time. It has a nautical origin, literally, and perhaps better translated as love of learning is the helmsman of life, the pilot of life. You see, a guide takes you on paths that already exist. The helmsman steers you through waters that have no path. And my friends, we find ourselves in new waters, choppy at times. And it is the love of learning that will be the helmsman as we find our way. And your own motto, Sur les loirs de Minerve, nous devenions du frère et sœur. Now I assume, by the way, the sœur got added a little late in the game. Audrey, is that right? <laughs> and not a minute too soon, I might add. Under the laws of Minerva, goddess of wisdom, we all become brothers and sisters. I find in your motto the heart of the founding story of Phi Beta Kappa. It's an iconic story that we often tell but fail adequately to mine the full power of. The five undergraduates who gathered at William and Mary in the heart of the American Revolution, December 5th, 1776, in the Raleigh Tavern. Now that often leads to humorous insights about the first secret society to be founded in a bar in America. But it's actually far more profound than that. It seems that taverns were precisely the place where revolutionary ideas were born in the 18th century. That was the place where people could gather for serious conversation outside of the prying ears of the crown and the church. And so it's not surprising that in the Raleigh Tavern, they gathered, committed to what was truly a revolutionary idea, that individuals, regardless of their background, regardless of their wealth, regardless of their lineage, committed to excellence in liberal learning and to free inquiry and free expression, would find in that process fellowship, become brothers and sisters through the laws of Minerva. What is radical is a challenge that inspires us still the need to build communities that are based at one and the same time on robust free expression, but protection of a sense of community. What I like to call vigorous civility. Let me begin with three stories. First, in the spring of 2001, as President Ainley mentioned, I was a visiting scholar at University College London, I was giving a talk on the subject of hate speech, something I was working on extensively at the time, and was asking questions about how we would think about where to put a limit on hate speech. And one of my colleagues, right out of central casting, charcoal gray suit and in a British accent I shall not attempt to imitate, said, 
Suppose that a group of skinheads got a truck, painted it up with racist slogans, and drove it right into the heart of Brixton, neighborhood of London that's predominantly uh, African and Caribbean descent. Would you agree that could be prohibited? And I began to tell him how I would think about this. I'd need to know more about what those skinheads actually had in mind for reasons I'll get to in just a moment here. And he stopped me in the middle and said, why is this so hard for you? We all know it's wrong. Why is this so hard for you? So that's the first story. The second story took place not far from here, right across the Petersburg Pass, for those of you who've done the ride, at Williams College, where I was privileged to serve as a trustee at the time. The president of the college called me with the following problem, inquiry. One of his students that morning, a young woman who was a Jewish student, woke up to find on her door a flyer, poster, that was a faux or mock eviction notice. It said, you have 24 hours to ev evacuate your room. It was obviously in resonance and in protest to flyers or posters put on the doors of Palestinian homes of those suspected of involvement in terrorism, whose homes will be destroyed by the Israeli Defense Force. By the way, I have to add my favorite part of this poster at the bottom, customized, it said, all expenses will be put on your student account. I thought that was a nice touch. Obviously, this young woman was very disturbed by this, and the president said to me, what can we do? What should we do? Well, that's the second story. And now the third story, closer to home for me during my time when I was president of Brandeis. It was in December of 2014, some of you will remember that in the aftermath of the deaths of Eric Garner and Michael Brown, two New York City police officers were murdered. One of our students, a leader of the Black Lives Movement uh, Matters movement, tweeted out a message that said, I have no sympathy for the families of these police officers. Now, I happen to know this young woman. I knew her well. I knew her, first of all, because she was a student leader. I also knew her because we had worked together on the post-Ferguson vigil that she had organized, at which I spoke, and at which she introduced our chief of police. So I knew perfectly well that she was not someone who hated police officers, quite the contrary. What she meant to say, I'm quite sure, was how is it that when Garner and Brown are killed, the world goes on, and when two police officers are killed, the world comes to a standstill. I'm quite sure that's what she meant to say, but that's not what she said. She tweeted, I have no sympathy for those police officers. Now, she had about 60 followers on Twitter at the time, so for some of us in the room, this is the rough equivalent of something that you would have said in the dining hall once upon a time. But of course, it wasn't said in the dining hall. One of those 60, I think the technical term is a troll, put that tweet up on a, let's say, right-wing heresy-chasing website, and it went viral. She was then inundated with email that you can only imagine. Now, President Ainley knows what happens next. You get lots of free advice as a president after that happens. Many who said, she has no place in this university and certainly shouldn't be receiving any scholarship funds in this university. And others who said the job of the president is to issue a statement forthrightly, succinctly, and solely recognizing her rights of free expression. So that's the third story. I'll come back to the Williams story and the Brandeis story at the end of my remarks. I start with the story from London in order to contextualize our context today. Because in most other countries in the Western world, most other liberal democracies, this issue is not so hard. Listen to what Germany punishes as a crime. Statements that are attacks on the human dignity of others by insulting, maliciously maligning, or defaming segments of the population. Or Britain, language that is threatening, abusive, or insulting, or behavior that is intended to stir up racial hatred whereby having regard to all the circumstances, racial hatred is likely to be stirred up. So why is this so hard for us? It is hard for us because the value of free expression is at the very core of the American experience and how much more so 
in a university campus. We exist for a mission, for a purpose, and it is a sacred mission and purpose. It is the creation and discovery of knowledge and the transmission of that knowledge through our teaching, our scholarship, and our learning with each other for the betterment of our communities, our nation, and the world. That mission requires the most robust form of academic freedom, of intellectual inquiry, and of free expression. So I start with the proposition that all speech, yes, even hateful speech, is presumptively protected in order that we might have the broadest form of free expression protected in our society. And this view finds deep resonance in American constitutional law. Take something as simple as flag burning. Even as the Supreme Court has become more conservative with time, it has consistently upheld the right to burn an American flag. Usually those opinions start with some language about the reprehensible nature of the act. Nonetheless, it is considered protected. So if it were as simple as that, as to say, and that is why we need broad free expression, then we would be done and we'd be off to our post Founders Day reception and at 2.15 you can go back to your classes. But it's not quite as simple as that because the broad protection of speech on campus, both under the First Amendment and in private universities under basic principles of free expression, still permits universities to protect students from being threatened and protects classes from being disrupted. So where do we draw the line? Well, stay with me down one quick blind alley because it's one that is frequently relied upon. The so-called distinction between speech and conduct. Speech is that which we protect, conduct which we can restrict. It's very tempting because it provides bright lines. And the deans and other academic administrators in the room know that we seek bright lines in order to decide these cases. But this is a bright line that is far too brittle because in too many cases, speech and conduct are not just related, they are inextricably intertwined. Think of the example I just mentioned, flag burning. Why is flag burning protected? Because flag burning is considered expression, not conduct. Well, hold that one in your mind for a second while we do another pyrotechnic constitutional law issue. A particular relevance to some of us in this room, the issue of whether or not young men were permitted to burn a draft card. And the Supreme Court in the mid-1960s in a case called the United States, United States against O'Brien upheld the law that prosecuted the burning of a draft card. Why? Because that's conduct. Well, it seems to me that the crime had nothing to do with burning a piece of paper. It was the concept, the expression of opposition to the draft. So isn't that expression, not conduct? And that flag burning, isn't flag burning also about the conduct behind it? So a wonderful legal scholar named John Hart Ely, it seems to me, got it exactly right writing about the flag burning case when he said, at the end of the day, the best way to understand certain kinds of behavior, it's 100% speech and 100% conduct. Inextricable, inseparable. So when we separate speech from conduct, it is the philosophical equivalent of the magician who puts the rabbit in the hat only to pull him out. If it's something that we want to protect, we'll call it speech. If it's something we want to punish, we'll call it conduct. And we will give very little guidance to our presidents or our deans. So where could we find a distinction? I would suggest a better place to find the distinction is in a concept known to every first year law student in a course in criminal law. And that is looking at the mental state of the actor. The law Latin is mens rea. If, for example, I were to tell you that the perpetrator of a particular set of events took a bat and hit another person in the head very hard, knocked him unconscious, big welt, a lot of loss of blood. And then I were to say, what crime has been committed? And we went around the room. My guess is you would say assault, assault with a deadly weapon. Some of you would say attempted murder, but one of you would say, you haven't given us enough facts. And you're right, because now I shall add two more facts. The perpetrator with the bat was standing like this. 
And the victim, as you can guess by now, like that. What have I done? I've taken what could be an attempted murder and made it into an accident. And what have I changed? Only the mental state of the actor, not even the physical manifestations. I've changed the actual event. I've changed even the harm to the victim. Why? Because as Oliver Wendell Holmes famously said, even a dog knows the difference between being tripped over and being kicked. And if a dog, how much more so do we? So if we can focus on what is in the mind of the actor, then we are able to distinguish not speech from conduct, which is too illusory, but that which intends to express views, even hateful views, and that which intends to threaten, to intimidate, or to instill fear. So two quick legal examples, and then we'll come back to Williams. Case, two cases came up to the United States Supreme Court at the same time under the name of Virginia against Black, testing the constitutionality of the Virginia cross-burning statute. The Virginia cross-burning statute said two things, the first of which was constitutionally unobjectionable, that it is a more serious kind of assault to assault someone within, with racial motivation to attempt to intimidate someone on the basis of race, what in my work we would call a standard hate crime law for enhanced punishment for racially motivated violence. So far, so good. It then says, if a cross is burned in the commission of an act, it shall be presumed that there was racial motivation. Ah, that's where that problem comes. Look at the two cases before the Supreme Court in Virginia against Black. Number one, the standard variety hate crime case. Black neighbor who was intimidated by the burning of a cross on their lawn by a white neighbor who previously had used their lawn as a firing range to say nothing of other racist behavior. Clearly, that was the final and most violent act. And there, the burning of the cross was an act of racially motivated assault. The other case was a Ku Klux Klan rally, at the conclusion of which a 25-foot cross was burned. For what purpose? For expressing the views of the Ku Klux Klan. Racist views, to be sure. White nationalist views, to be sure. Views I certainly abhor, and I would hope that all of you would as well but views that they wish to express. And what we have changed is not the physical object or the pyrotechnics, it was in the mind of the actor. Which brings us back to Williams. So when the president of Williams said to me, what should we do with this young woman's complaint? We talked a little bit about Virginia against black. And he said, well, that's all well and good. How are we gonna know what was in the mind of the actor? I said, well, for starters, why don't you find out how many flyers were posted? If, for example, one flyer was posted on the door of just one student, then that sounds like she was targeted for religious reasons. If, as turns out, those flyers were put up on every door throughout that entire dorm, that sounds like an expression of views, perhaps done in a careless way, maybe even in a harmful way, but an expression of views that was done about the situation in the Middle East. And so when we look at what is in the mind of the actor, we get a clear line of what we should protect and what we might punish. And that answers only the first question. The second can be answered a little more quickly. The first is the question of what should we protect and what should we punish. The second is having decided we protect speech, is there really nothing more to say? I'm reminded of an essay that the art critic Robert Hughes wrote some years ago. Some of you will remember there was a set of events in Cincinnati, Ohio, around the art museum where Robert Maplethorpe had an exhibition. Maplethorpe's work was, to put it mildly, sort of edgy stuff that was not everybody's taste and was actually offensive to many. So the good and the great of Cincinnati decided to shut down the exhibition, causing Maplethorpe to sue. And needless to say, you can guess what happens. Maplethorpe makes a First Amendment claim, and he wins. And Robert Hughes wrote an essay in which he said, Americans, for some reason, want to constitutionalize all these questions. The question whether this art is protected or not, he said, is easy and ultimately, to me, Hughes said, uninteresting. Because the interesting question is the aesthetic question. Is any of this work any good? And his own conclusion was some of it was quite good, some of it was poor, and some of it was just plain lousy. 
But you never get to the aesthetic question if you stop at the threshold question. So with us in the area of speech. If we constitutionalize the question and ask only the question of whether speech is protected or not, we never get to the more probing question. What is the kind of community we wish to have? Oh, there are many things you have a right to say that your community should discourage you from saying. Not as a matter of law, but as a matter of the society that we build. And that brings me back to what happened at Brandeis. So recall the two choices I seem to have were to suspend or expel the student or at least take her scholarship away from her on the one hand, or to issue a statement protecting her speech rights. I found that to be an impoverished choice set and in fact chose something slightly different in the middle, if you will. I started by saying we take free speech very seriously on this campus. No student will be punished in any way, shape, or form for expressing her or his views on this campus, not on my watch. But then I said, I also have free speech. And you choose these moments carefully if you're a wise president, and you're lucky, you have a wise president. You choose these moments carefully, but then you take them. And I said, having worked closely with police officers throughout my professional career, I reject her views. I found them to be offensive, and I would urge others to do the same. Now, when you get it roughly right, the incoming fire comes 360. <laughs> and so it came not long later in a case involving some of my faculty colleagues who had a listserv that they thought was password protected. I regret to say it was password protected only in the sense of having your password as a university member, which is, say, a little bit like a back door that barely has a latch on it. In this listserv, they had exchanged pretty rough and in some cases disgusting expressions about my predecessor, about various other kinds of political issues, about Israel. Uh, it, it, it too went viral. By the way, the same troll, one person with an iPhone can do many things. So again, the word comes down, this faculty member should be fired or they should have their free expression protected. Now, I don't want you to think I did this often. I'm giving you the two examples where I weighed in. <laughs> a wise president doesn't call balls and strikes on everything said on campus, but you picked your spots. And I did express my views on what they had said. And interestingly, within 24 hours, I had the following two conversations. A trustee who said to me, you think that expressing your criticism will have some impact on them. You've got to rattle some teeth here. In my business, in my law firm, in my hospital, fill in the blank, we would fire somebody. That's how we get their attention. And I said exactly what Stephen would say. I said, thank you very much for your insights. <laughs> then the next day I met with the faculty members. How dare you express your opinion on what we said, they said to me. You have chilled our speech. So let me share with you my response to them, which may surprise you. Not all chilling effects are wrong. What we classically mean by chilling effects, people who are punished for expressing their views, people who are fired, lose job benefits, thrown out of school and the like, that's what we classically mean by chilling effect. That is perni pernicious. That is inconsistent with an academic institution worthy of the name. But then there's a different kind of chilling effect that we might not even call that, where we influence each other, cause each other to listen to what Lincoln would have called the better angels of our nature, and where we wish to be impress, impressive to others, where we know our words have consequences. And so vigorous civility calls not for vigorous agreement but understanding that words have consequences and all that we are permitted to say, we ought not to say. So I will conclude with what I would call the three rules of vigorous civility. First, we can disagree with each other without delegitimizing each other. Second, we can question each other's opinions without questioning each other's motives in expressing those opinions. And third, and perhaps most, every conversation, controversial 
as it may be, should begin with a robust search for common ground. And let me say just a word of what I mean by common ground. I don't mean that we all talk long enough till we can sing Kumbaya and agree with each other. One of my favorite articles I ever wrote was with one of my opponents in the hate crime debate. She felt that hate crimes were a violation of free expression. Punishing thought. I obviously felt differently. We've been on several panels together. We were invited to yet another panel. It was a symposium and I said to her, am I really gonna write the same piece? And are you gonna write the same piece? We've done this a dozen times. And then I read an article, op-ed in the New York Times, written by a pro-choice and a pro-life advocate. They decided to see if they could write 800 words in which they agreed. It was a fascinating article. Neither attempted to convince the other of the ultimate issue, but there was so much in which they agreed. So I called up my adversary and I said, hey, Susan, I got a new idea. At this point, I could write your piece, you could write my piece. What if we wrote a piece together on what we agree on? A forced discipline of a search for common ground. One of my greatest mentors in law school was the late Charles Black, one of the intellectual architects of the anti-segregation cases, helped in the team that argued Brown against Board of Education. He was an advocate of judicial activism, courts playing a major role in society, cases like Roe against Wade and Brown against Board of Education. His intellectual counterweight at the Yale Law School at the time was a man named Alexander Bickel, also a great scholar. Bickel who argued the Pentagon Papers case before the Supreme Court. Bickel was a believer in judicial restraint, the passive virtues of the court. Bickel passed away tragically young, and when he did, Black wrote a memorial essay in the Yale Law Journal in which he said, Bickel and I agreed on everything except for our opinions. <laughs> if we have lost the ability to say of others, we agree on everything except for our opinions, then we have lost something very precious and perhaps irreplaceable. But if we have maintained and can enhance the ability to say to others, we agree on everything except for our opinions, then we have built the kind of community that is worthy of what 200 years ago was envisioned in a Phi Beta Kappa chapter and 22 years before that in the creation of this great institution. Thank you. <laughs>